Yeah, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to have you, everyone here. And this uh, particular webinar has really generated like a huge amount of interest. Um, it's really great to have it have it overbooked actually. Um, it's and as you know, you're here because it's about living mulches. So I've been working on the living mulches since I joined uh, the ORC about just over a year ago. And uh, I find living mulches really exciting. Um, particularly because I think it's interesting how it addresses challenges in conventional farming systems um, for those farmers that are using direct drilling and really reliant on glyphosate. I, I sort of look at that and think of it maybe as the Achilles heel of direct drillers in the conventional world uh, and living mulches are a way they may be able to reduce herbicide use um, while still direct drilling. And then on the uh, organic side, I also think it addresses our sort of Achilles heel in organics in that we tend to rely on the plow a lot and we want to get to less tillage. So direct, uh, living mulches are a way to maybe reduce tillage in organic systems. So it's kind of in both systems, it's, it's, it's maybe of interest for slightly different reasons, but it's kind of brought the organic and conventional worlds together. Um, so this is talking about, a little bit about a project that was funded um, recently through Elizabeth Gilmore Charitable Foundation and previously Organic Arable and Innovative Farmers of Soil Association um, were involved with, with our living mulches work. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our um, some of our findings, but mostly we're going to have our two speakers talking about their practical experiences. So just a quick, um, this is our running order. So I'm just gonna hopefully not go over 15 minutes and Matt and Izzy are gonna cut me off if I do, because I tend to ramble. Uh, and then Matt's gonna talk for about 20 minutes. He'll have a presentation and some time for questions. And likewise, then we'll have uh, uh, David as well. And then at the end, we'll have time for just a general discussion on any topics that have come up during the session that we wanna chat about a little bit more. So, um, oh, and I just want to, yeah, rules of engagement. So we're going to aim for, if you've got any questions during uh, any of the presentations, uh, maybe type them into the chat and we'll keep track of them there. And then at the end of each presentation, we, we can we can kind of follow up on them or you'll also have a chance then you could put up your hand. But we're going to try and not to stop the speakers unless there's something really, really some burning question that you really need clarified during the talk. OK. Um, so let's just see what I have to say here. Yeah, so this is a bit of the history to the project. So um, between 2020 and 2022, which was actually before any of any of the ORC team on this uh, meeting actually worked with ORC, so before Matt, Izzy and I were there, um, there was a project run uh, through Innovative Farmers Program, which is a soil association program funded by AHDB and Organic Arable. And uh, Dominic Amos was the real leader on that. He worked at Organic Research Center at the time. And I don't know if he's joined this call, but he um, we still work with Dominic quite a bit. Uh, he works with Organic Arable now, um, but we collaborate quite a bit on, on some of our other projects. So Dominic was the one that really uh, set this up and, and collected lots of interesting data over a couple of years. So it involved storage doing strip trials on farms where they had farmers uh, strips, growing, planting strips of living mulches, and then alongside uh, having cultivated controls. And actually, we have Mark Lee, I think, on this call. Mark Lee um, was one of the main sort of collaborating farmers really involved at that time and throughout the project. So if I say anything wrong, Mark, you can kind of jump in and correct me. Um, but yeah, it was using these wild white clovers, small medium leaf clovers, um, in the proportions there on the screen. And they ran it at, at on a few different farms. And these were conventional and organic farms. And I'm not going to show you many results at all, but this one I quite like. I took this out of Dominic's report. And it's a really interesting um, set of treatments, a subset of treatments that they had on some of those farms where they had um, the control, which is your conventional tilled cereal. These are And these are cereal yields. Um, I think it's sort of a combination of different cereal types anyway, but the main thing to take home from this is that if you compare plowed with the direct drilled, so that's just basically showing you the effect of no longer tilling and the yield reduction that resulted just from the direct drilling bit. So about, uh, in this case, about a ton per hectare on average. Then if you combine direct drilling with also a living mulch, you get a further reduction of about another ton. So it kind of is interesting showing you that if you're doing a system that's got a living mulch 
part of your yield reduction is due to the that you're not tilling. The other part is something to do with the living mulch being there and probably competition for resources, et cetera. So I found that quite interesting. So in general, tend to get lower yields with living mulch systems. We also tend to get lower yields with the directorial no-till systems, right? In in not always, but in in most cases. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and this is Mark Lee here, and uh, this is just to show you a little more detail on Mark's system. So we have different ways of implementing living mulches, right? And some some farmers are going for a permanent cover, right? They want like clover in their fields for many years and just drilling into that permanent cover. Mark has a little bit of a different system where he does, he has this rotation, you can see five years, and he's gonna jump in now if I've got this wrong. Um, and these are tilled, the wheat, the oats, and the spring wheat. And it's just at this sort of year three, I'd call this year three, he's under sown with the clover. And then in this fourth year um, is direct oats, in this case, direct drilled into the clover lay. So in, to my mind, that's sort of the only really true living mulch year is that fourth year of the rotation. Then the, then the clover is left as a lay for another year, and then it will be plowed again. So this is sort of periodic plowing, periodic direct drilling and using the living mulch. And I think Mark would explain that he's done this basically to get sneak in an extra cereal year into his rotation. So he has a lay growing during this sort of fourth year here. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but anyway, I'm pointing at the, the winter oats. Um, so he's got he's got a lay there. So that is a lay year. There's soil and, you know, soil improvement, soil building going on. Uh, and then he's got a second year, but he's he's putting in the cereal direct drilling into the clover lay to get a bit more cash return uh, in that year. So, so that's quite a sort of an an interesting way of incorporating living mulches into a system that also has plowing. So that was just one example. We've done a lot of work at Mark's farm over the years. So Matt, who's here on the call, his master's project. This year, he was out looking at some of the biodiversity impacts of these systems at Mark's farm. So we just did a quick, quick look at his data today, actually. <clears throat> First time I've had a look at it. Um, and you can see there the um, earth. Oh, that's a picture of an earthworm. Oh, I made a mistake. There's supposed to be a picture of Isabel, but she's stuck behind the earthworm there. But anyway, these are the earthworm average numbers and this is very dramatic so this is living mulches you can see almost 20 for each sample point that um that matt and izzy were out where they were out collecting the earthworms if you have living mulches compared to only about five in the conventional till part so not surprising you also see often see those kinds of results right um in systems also systems that are are um direct drill right so just the reduction in tillage can promote the uh, earthworms as well. So I thought I thought that was quite interesting. Let's see if this one's oh, there's the earthworm now. Um, but interesting just to show you that it isn't all sort of positive towards the living mulch in terms of biodiversity. These are the carabid numbers. So total brown beetles. And that's a pit a pitfall trap that we use to, to catch them. Right. So they're little beetles that walk across the surface of the soil and fall into the trap. So it's a way of kind of quantifying differences in beetle populations. So in the, for in this case, there were more actually in that con conventional tilled section than in the living mulch section. So these are, you know, indicators of biodiversity and health of the ecosystem that we often monitor as scientists. And um, uh, there's a lot of interest sort of in how different practices affect these. But it's interesting to see that there's sort of positive for one, negative for the other. I've also put this one in. This is something called CO2 burst, maybe not so familiar to most of you, uh, but one because I'm I used to do a lot of work in laboratories and this is one I used to use uh, quite a bit. It's a useful indicator. It kind of integrates uh, the size of the microbial biomass in your soil. So the bacteria and fungi that are in your soil and also how much reserves are there for them to um, metabolize. So it's just a kind of a quick way of measuring. So you're basically your sort of microbial health of the soil. So this is showing much higher CO2 burst in the living mulch than the conventional till. I find that really surprising, actually, because I wouldn't have expected the tillage and the reduction in tillage and the increased sort of clover cover in that living mulch year to have had what looks like quite a dramatic effect on soil microbiology that fast. Um, so, yeah, that I thought that was quite an interesting one as well. 
Um, just what we're doing at the moment with this Living Mulch project. So, yeah, we don't have any funding at the moment to do a lot of work on it, but we're still really interested in keeping up uh, with the farmers that are, are using these living mulches. And uh, we've tried to integrate some of the work into some of our other projects. So this is Tom Fairfax. He's a farmer up in uh, up in Northumberland there where I live. And uh, he is involved with this other project we're running that's called Live Seeding. So in Live Seeding, we're comparing different varieties of wheat, um, again, using strips in fields and sort of looking at which ones perform best in organic systems. So Tom's part of that project, but he's chosen a field that's um, in a living mulch to establish those strips of the different wheat varieties. So that will be quite an interesting one because we'll be able to also do a bit of an assessment on whether some varieties of wheat are better than others within living mulch systems. So, so that's kind of interesting. So we're going to monitor that this year. This is a, in the picture that is a living mulch field where he's drilled the wheat. You can see the strips of wheat and the and the area where the clover is looks a bit sort of battered, but we're pretty sure that's going to come back. So that I drilled that with I think it's a Claydon drill that kind of disturbs the soil quite a bit. Um, and the other one we're doing is this field, and I don't know if you can see on the screen. Um, that that is a living mulch field and the whole thing is a living mulch but the bit on the right the drilling method was different to the bit on the left of this line <clears throat> and this is with another fellow up in Northumberland Rupert Wales Fairbairn who might be on the call he told me he was going to join the call um, and he's not too far from Tom so I'm planning to kind of pop in a few times over the season and look at these different establish met establishment methods that Rupert's been using in the living mulches to see over the season uh, which one works out best. So he's tried out some different different drills and I think some different preparation prior to drilling as well. But if he's on the call, he might be able to tell us more uh, in the discussion period. I do believe, oh yeah, that was everything actually I was going to say at this point. Um, oh, well, I think I might be right on time actually. So um, yeah, at this point I was going to hand over to Matt. So Matt's a... Uh, um, I guess I came across Matt on Twitter. Um, oh, there's Rupert. It just popped up on my screen. I came across Matt on Twitter um, a couple of years ago and realized that he was someone who was doing a lot of interesting things in organic farming and with living mulches. So um, we've kind of reached out to him to contribute to Groundswell this year, hopefully with in the agroecology tent. And we also thought it'd be great if, if Matt could uh, tell us a little bit about his systems tonight as well. So um, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt England. Um, I'm the estate manager at Fring Estate um, in North Norfolk. Um, I've been here for the last two and a half years. Um, my background originally was um, I'm from a family farm in Cambridgeshire, uh, but until my role at Fring, I was on a, I was working mainly on um, seed and agri-environment consultancy. Um, working for Hutchinson's Oak Bank and then Brown and Co before that. Um, so it's been quite a challenging couple of years having to jump back into farming, jump on a tractor, um, but I'm finding it really interesting, especially having to deal with um, all of this in like an organic framework. So um, I'll just give you a brief summary of the estate and also um, how our farming system works and then just talk you through how we're getting on with living mulches um, here on the farm. Uh, so Fring State is just um, in North Norfolk here. Um, we are around 100, uh, 1,450 hectares, um, 300 hectares of which is conventionally farmed by a tenant and in a contract farming agreement. Um, 850 hectares is rented off the Sandringham Estate and farmed in hand. Um, we also have 300 hectares of commercially managed woodland, as well as diversification, including hollow lets, commercial lets, wood chip, renewables, and a commercial shoot. So the organic farming at Fring, which is the bit we farm in hand, um, this is on the Sandringham estate, um, and it was converted to organic in 2021 as part of our tenancy agreement with our landlord, um, uh, King Charles. It's a very light sandy farm um, with large areas of it um, were heathland and common land um, pre-World War II. So ploughed up, ploughed up during the war and really it should have really gone back into that because it's very, very poor land, which never really yielded anything conventionally. 
Um, so as part of the agreement with the, with Sandringham Estate, um, we agree that we'd put those areas back into a countryside stewardship scheme, um, which meant that around 50% of the farm is actually in countryside stewardship options such as AB8, so wildflowers, um, as well as wild bird mixes and various other, other options. So all the blue on the map there you can see is actually all the old heathland um, and common land, um, which is, is currently in countryside stewardship. Um, the rest of the farm is in a seven year organic rotation. Um, I've sort of settled on this one, um, but it does seem to change every year so far as I'm still learning, learning my way a bit. So um, we're, we're three years of herbal lays, um, spring barley, winter linseed or winter oats. Um, then we've got pigs on the farm as well, and then back into winter oats and then finishing up with peas or a, or a stewardship option. So that's a, a brief summary of the farming here on the estate. Um, Next, I'll sort of move on to why, why I've decided to have a look into living mulches. Um, now, Judy's mentioned a few of these things already, um, but I think one of the main things is just maintaining that constant cover and life in the soil. So having that, feeding all the soil biology, nutrient cycling, carbon capture, all that good stuff. But for me, the biggest thing is being able to harvest the sun's energy um, at a time of year when as farmers, we don't often have a lot of growing. Um, July, August, September, um, if you can get a crop off and then have something immediately grow, I think that's a real benefit as we're essentially harvest, we're, we're sort of harvesting the sun's energy. It just seemed mad to me that during the sunniest months in the UK, we don't have anything growing. So that was sort of the main reason for, for why I wanted to try living mulches. There's also other benefits um, with the organic system. So having um, that mulch there hopefully will keep some weeds down. Um, having a nitrogen accumulation within that rotation is obviously really important if we can get that working for the organic rotation. Um, and then this year proved how important it is to have that mulch and how useful it was at um, protecting the soil from climate extremes. Um, the, the, the ground where we had the living mulch travelled really well um, and was easy to drill onto um, after all that heavy rain we've had this year. Um, and also again, uh, helping reduce the leaching of nutrients and trying to reduce or eliminate cultivations, which is very difficult um, in an organic system because we do rely quite heavily on the plough. Uh, so I've had three years worth of trials here at Fring. Um, the first year um, I inherited lots of undersown red clover, um, which was obviously very competitive. And I tried to establish spring barley into that in a few different ways. Um, I also attempted intercropping uh, or bicrops, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that's worth bringing into the conversation because it's just the way two crops work together. I've, I've sort of learned a lot by doing the intercropping that sort of translates into the into the living mulches as well. Um, there's definitely something going on when you have two things growing in the same field. And um, yeah, so that was quite interesting and, and translates quite nicely into this discussion too. Um, so and then in year two, I've continued experimenting with bicropping. Um, I didn't actually have any um, living mulches to establish into, but I did establish um, what I think is the correct clover, a Rivendale um, small leaf white clover into spring barley last last April, um, which was ready for trials this year. So that brings us to this year where I've established the white clover um, into the living mulch. Uh, sorry, I've established winter oats into the living mulch. Um, I've also had a go at establishing a, um, a living mulch into linseed, and I'm continuing um, intercropping experiments. So just to run you through some photos and to show you what it's looked like on the ground. Um, so harvest 22, I inherited, like I said, lots of this red clover. Um, this was actually quite quite difficult to manage with. Obviously, it grows very thick. Um, I didn't start the job until December, so my only option was to establish a spring crop into this. Um, so I thought I'd try and see how I could manage it in a number of different ways. Um, so I tried ploughing and drilling, uh, min till and drilling, and direct drilling um, straight into the into the red clover. I did this around early March when the clover hadn't really grown much. Um, so the direct drill went in fine, germinated fine. Um, but then was very quickly swamped out by the red clover, as you'd probably expect. Um, the min till, I knocked out about 50% of the red clover, um, but again, um, a month or so into the germination of the barley, the clover was already taking over. Um, 
and then plowing and drilling um seemed the best the best technique to manage that really because it um yeah obviously gets rid of the clover um releases some nitrogen so clover's breaking down and we actually got some pretty good good yields off that land um could yeah so about three and a half tons a hectare, I think, which is actually doesn't sound very impressive along this land. It's quite good, I think. Considering we had no inputs. Um, so I also tried intercropping. Um, this is peas and barley grown together and beans and oats grown together. Um, just really interesting because there was there were some real benefits I saw in the cereal crop um, from growing the two together. Um, you can see that picture on the left there. The oats um, grown with a legume are the one on the on the left. Um, so the, the crop is visibly much bigger um, than the oats grown in a monoculture. Whether that's something to do with the lower density sowing rate um, or less light competition, um, I'm not really sure, but it was definitely it was definitely very obvious in the crop. And then also importantly in the organic rotation, um, we had really good weed control. We had a cereal with a legume. Where I tried just a legume on its own, like those peas there, um, it was absolutely full of, um, of fat hen and various other weeds. Interestingly, as well, I also got an extra ton and a half a hectare off the boats versus the um, the spring oats farm average. Um, so again, something very sort of interesting going on there, growing growing two things in the same field, um, which is why I was quite keen to sort of pursue the um, the living mulch trial after after seeing how well growing two things two things in the same field works. Uh, so the lessons from Harvest 22 were that red clover is far too competitive. Um, spring crops don't have long enough to grow away from the clover. Even if it's a white clover, I think it would still be quite difficult. Um, Ploughing in clover definitely is effective just for if you only have the living mulch in place for, for over winter. Um, and there's clear benefits from growing two crops in the same field. Uh, so harvest 23 came round, and although I didn't have any um, any living mulches to try drilling into, I had ploughed in some clover um, that had been a living mulch um, and ploughed it in, in, in the spring. And it was just in this square here on the field. This is a, a green area index um, from an app I used. Um, and that square show, showed up so clearly um, where I ploughed in the living mulch. And you can see in the field, this is this is within that square there. It was much denser and much thicker and greener. And this is outside that where the, the P and P and oat by crop really wasn't looking anywhere near as good. And you can sort of just make out the the line there. It was very, very obvious um, in the field. Um, so again, just showing that trying to use these these living mulches in the rotation um, is is definitely effective. Again, I saw lots of weed control benefits from intercropping. Um, I focused more on the legume here, which was a bit of a mistake because the yields weren't quite so good. Um, but it, it was really interesting here seeing the, the difference between where I had oats with the beans on the left and then no oats at all. And it was almost, well, it was pretty much un, un, unharvestable um, with the amount of weeds we had in there. In that harvest as well, I also um, managed to under-sow um, under my Rivendale white clover. I sowed it in around April, um, so it was a nice wet summer this year. So um, yeah, the clover established really well. So by harvest, um, it was looking like that. Um, and as soon as the crop came off, off the field, it, it sort of exploded into life and, and really covered the whole the whole ground on the field, so I had 30 hectares of that established, um, ready for trials um, of drilling into it uh, this year for this harvest. Um, so uh, on the winter, so this winter, just following following establishing that living mulch, um, I did um, some soil assessments, and as Julie was mentioning earlier, um, the living mulch was showing some really clear benefits um, to biology in the soil. Um, in the plough work on the left there, I found absolutely no worms, whereas the living mulch had six or seven worms. Um, so definitely, definitely doing some good um, over winter, keeping that sort of just keeping the soil alive and having things having things growing in there. So things I learned from Harvest 23. Um, 
So the clover undersown uh, definitely gives a clear benefit to the following crop. Uh, weed control um, from having cereals and the legume was still pretty clear. Uh, the bi crops perform really badly uh, when trying to favour a legume. Um, and a wet summer is very useful for establishing a living mulch. So I didn't get that the year before, so it was very useful, um, but you don't always always guarantee every year. Um, and then definitely the soil looks better in better condition going into winter um, on those living mulch fields. Uh, so that brings me to this year and how far I've got with the living mulch trial. So as I was drilling linseed in the field next door, I thought I'd just give it a go in September, um, drilling a linseed crop in, into the living mulch. I cut it right down as low as it would go and then direct drilled um, the linseed using our Horsch Pronto drill, which isn't strictly a, a direct drill, um, but because we're on such light soil, it cuts in absolutely fine. And as long as you roll it afterwards, it does it does close the slot. Um, so that was established into there in the, on the 13th of September. And I also drilled uh, Rivendell white clover with the linseed in a two and a half hectare trial um, just to see how a living mulch in a linseed crop works um, and see how that sort of uh, moves throughout the year and what happens with that. Uh, so the direct drilled linseed, um, that seemed to be a bit of a failure. Maybe the linseed wasn't competitive enough and Still in September, the um, the clover's got a lot of growing to do. Um, so although there was the linseed germination started growing, um, it was soon swamped out by the clover. Uh, whether I could have um, maybe run the topper over one more time a couple of weeks after drilling or not, I'm not sure, but it, it doesn't seem to have worked particularly well. Um, so I've, I've sort of written that one off for now. Um, and then the next job was then to try establishing uh, winter oats um, into the living mulches. So the living mulch looked like it does on the right hand side there where that tree is. So it was very thick across the whole field um, going into October. I then um, brought some sheep on who grazed it right down to the ground throughout October and into early November. Um, and they grazed it very tight, so it knocked it back fairly hard. And then by the time they came off, um, the clover wasn't growing anymore, so it was ideal conditions to then drill um, Muscani winter oats um, into, into that living mulch pile. Um, I drilled the oats at 210 kilos a hectare, up to 230 in some places, just to see how that did. Um, the farm standard was 190, so it was just a bit higher just to, to make up for the fact that the Pronto may not have drilled everything, everything perfectly. So. Um, that was on the 10th of November. It germinated fine and started to move away from the clover, which by now had stopped growing and was just sitting there dormant, ready for winter. As the sheep came off the next field, um, I used that as my control. So I ploughed um, what was left of the clover in um, and then drilled that as I normally would on the 1st of December. Um, and one end of the field, I tried min tilling just to give the clover a bit of, no a, bit of a knock and see if we could knock it back enough to get the, the oats away. Um, there was a fairly good frost after, which, which I hope would kill the clover, but it never did. And if you can see from that picture, the, the clover is still, still there. Um, but it's also left lots of space for, for weeds to come in, which isn't great either. Uh, so that's how it's starting to look a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is when the clover started to grow, so the soil temperatures get to 10 degrees. Um, that clover started to move, but luckily, um, the luckily the oats have started to to grow as well. So I'm flattening that bone up. Um, so, um, so yeah, as as we come to last week, this is how it looks when I went out there and took some photos. Um, the oats are still just about keeping ahead of the clover. I'm hoping the clover's got about as tall as it's going to get now. So hopefully the, 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 the oats will start to push on um, in the next month or so. Um, you can see from um, the picture here that the, the living mulch has really covered the ground, so it's not going to allow any space for any weeds to germinate, bar, bar a few perennials that are already there. Um, 
so my thinking is that it's it's about as good as it's going to get at the minute and um, we'll have to see how it goes i did put um some digestate on this as well in february which seems to have helped everything move and look quite healthy um and then this is just a picture of how that white clover is doing um in the bottom of the linseed that i sowed in september I also did a few more soil picks and again, um, as Julie said, lots more worms um, in the living mulch, 16 in the in the living mulch that have been direct drilled um, versus one worm in the ploughed in living mulch. Um, so you definitely do seem to dam damage the biodiversity a bit by ploughing. Um, and then finally, there's quite interesting here, um, the just this, this uh, these two crops here, these were both drilled on the same day. Um, the living mulch um, was obviously just direct drilled into living mulch. This was drilled into a field um, that was following pigs. Um, it had been ploughed and drilled as we normally would, um, but with plenty of nutrition and stuff there. So you would have thought they would be looking similar, but um, potentially this is, this is maybe just the um, the sort of the clover forcing the, the oats to grow taller, but it, they certainly look a bit healthier. Um, and that's pretty much where I've got to. So lessons from uh, Harvest 24 so far. Uh, grazing depot seems to have worked pre-drilling. Uh, the later sowing once the clover stopped growing seems to be the best way to, to get it to work. Um, linseed is probably too early sown to, to work because the clover is too competitive. Um, and importantly, this year the, the living mulch travelled really well in what was a very wet, wet winter. Um, but I do think I have got quite lucky this winter and it's been a very mild winter. So the oats have been growing right the way through, um, which has given them plenty of chances to get ahead um, of the living mulch. Um, and this is just a quick picture of today. I tried harrowing the living mulch um, just to see if I could knock the clover back a little bit. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it's really done anything. It's just sort of made me feel like I'm doing something. So um, we'll have to see. Um, so yeah, that's it. Has anyone got any questions? That's great. Thanks. Yeah, I can see a couple there in the uh, in the chat. Alex, you had a couple around um, drilling date. Do you want to do you want to just ask that one? I wasn't sure which uh, which crop you were talking about there with the drill asking about the drilling date. Yeah, I think uh, that was that was actually answered in the end. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, okay. I just wondered about the seed rate actually for the under sowing the clover. Um, what what you'd put that in at? Um, five kilos a hectare, I think. I'd have to double okay. check, um, but I'm pretty sure it went at five kilos a hectare. Yeah. Okay. And do you think there's any rationale for reducing the cash crop uh, seed rate so that that doesn't compete too heavily for water and uh, sort of light to try um, and get the understory to establish. Yeah, potentially. Um, yeah, because that's I, I found that a lot with the with the buy crops. You can you can actually get away with reducing the cash crop quite significantly and mm. still get a fairly good cash crop, um, which would then give you a lot more space for the for the living mulch to grow on. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm. And actually, I liked your question there, Alex, too about the. Um, other uh, crops apart from clover, because I've been thinking about that too um, as living mulches. So you mentioned black medic um, as maybe an alternative. I don't know if anyone else has tried an alternative to clover as a leguminous understory. Is that one you've ever thought about trying out, Matt? Black medic? Um, I actually think when I was at Oak Bank, um, we did that on some of the sand dream game covers as a way of sort of giving them a bit of uh, nitrogen um, with black medic. So. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting one because it isn't as competitive as um as clover, so it could it could work. Yeah. I just don't know how, how good it would be for weed suppression. True. In, yeah, yeah. In the organic system, because I can already see now that I'm starting to get more perennial weeds coming through in the so quite big perennial weeds coming through in the in the living mulch. So how long the living mulch will last before before they get too big, I'm not sure. So yeah. if you had a more open black medic crop, I'm not sure. Certainly worth having a look at. Yeah, um, I can see Mark Palmer. You've got your hand up. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Matt. Um, a couple of things. Have you thought about doing some some um, 
foliar test to see whether the nitrogen content's higher in the cover crop, in the um, in the in the oats in the um, you know the cash crop in the in the under sow. Yeah, I've done them actually. I've done I did them on the twenty second of March. I was there, had my agronomist out, so we've 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 done them, and I'm just waiting the results to come in. So I can I can share that share that with them. Um, We'll get reset when they do come in. Yeah, cool. And and have you looked at the sort of modulation levels on the clovers? Um, I haven't actually really. I'm sort of dug in. I was looking for worms rather than rather than any modulation. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure there's probably something going on there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I don't know if you know any more, Julie. So how how much does a living sort of clover crop actually feed a crop that's growing? Is there anything going on there or? Mm, yeah, or interesting. Really there, there, there's. There's there's a yeah there, I, there will be sort of transferred nitrogen from sort of sloughed off dead roots and and nodules possibly and and um, you know dead leaves and that sort of thing but they don't sort of directly they're not you know generous sharing their nitrogen no, intentionally right. with the crop at all I, I don't think it's just decaying so, then yeah. I guess yeah, yeah one of the yeah. things I think the leguminosi project has come up with or one of the sort of precursors research well that was showing that in a in a wheat bean mix um they somebody done some isotope trials and were finding that the nitrogen in the beans was ending up in the ear of the wheat could do just by what i've said you know just yeah sort yeah of the, you so know, it's going to be floating around in the system yeah yeah um so there, there is some trans apparently mm -hmm. some transfer but it'd be interesting to see um yeah the effect of that i mean the the crop looks a lot, lot bigger. It'd be interesting to see things like tiller rakes and things like you'll see that, I guess, when you cut, harvest it. So, yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, and let me see, uh, Paul. Yeah, Paul Barnes, you asked about any soil mineral end tests before and now in the living mulch, which I guess would sort of address, partly address that. You know, is there any free nitrogen floating around? Have you done any mineral end? Do you I do did. Any they, they I did. They didn't actually give me the information I wanted, though. So, yeah. Well, they what do you mean that they, they didn't... sort of they, they said I only had 19 kilos of N in the in the cyst, in the in the field, so that didn't sound like very much at all. In in a living under the living mulch. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting, right? Because it's gonna yeah. it will actually be soaking up mineral N. It's it's yeah. not you know it legumes do take up mineral N from the soil as well, mm. right? So yeah, that's interesting. Um, I wonder uh, if we should move on. Uh, there's a few interesting comments um, in the in the chat. I'm just looking at them here, but maybe we could wait to the end. Do you think should we just to pick up on some of those, if that's okay, and maybe go on to the next speaker? Yeah. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Yeah, just because I think we're running slightly behind, aren't we, Matt? Is it you want to introduce? Yeah, so yeah, up next we've got David Newman, who's um, from Buxom uh, Market Garden in Buckinghamshire. Um, yeah, so he's got a vegetable plots with um, clover direct drilled. So yeah, over to you, David. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you see me? We can see you. <laughs> You're good. I can't see you, but I can see my screen, so that's what matters. Well, we can't see your screen yet. <laughs> At least I can't see it. Uh... Okay. Let's try again. Did I have an earlier? Yeah, I've heard it. Here we go. That coming through. We'll have to get Matt to do the magic otherwise. Yeah, it hasn't come through yet. I wonder if we should go to plan B. Matt's talking there. I think he might be saying he's gonna run he's it gonna from his it. screen. Yeah, great. Good, good. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, just let me know when you need to jump down to the next next slide. Yeah. Brilliant job. Just shut that down. Right, good evening everybody and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I've just got a quick thank you to make to uh, Matt and Mark Lee who I met last year at the Living Mulches Open Day up in Shropshire and sort of inspired me to do a bit more on this front which I've been sort of dabbling with a bit for a few years at the Market Garden. So that sort of pushed me on to do a lot more last year. 
which is when I really came into the project and, and went sort of full out um, on the market garden. Um, so I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're doing in the market garden and I'll tell you about uh, how we've sort of fitted the project in over the last growing season. Um, so uh, Buxom uh, came about um, in 2006. Um, I've been a passionate gardener all my life, um, running the school um, gardens, uh, vegetable garden gardens at home. And um, in that year, there was quite a lot of um, baby dish salad coming into the shops. Uh, my vision was to grow the best um, and freshest salad um, because I wasn't very impressed with what they were offering in the supermarkets. So that's how the sort of market garden came about. Uh, and then also through my experience uh, in dairy, arable and pig farming, uh, I felt there was a real need to reduce the number of people be between the producer and the consumer. And so that was my other goal to sort of basically hopefully take all the middlemen out uh, and produce everything and set, sell it on to the, uh, the consumer. And therefore, you haven't got to produce quite so much. Uh, you can obviously have a lot more of the margin um, and hopefully an enjoyable lifestyle. So that was sort of my whole goal. And that's what Buxton's become over the last nearly 20 years now, which is unbelievable. Um, and uh, and here we are today presenting this to you. So it'll be interesting what feedback I can get. Um, so the interesting thing at uh, the farm, firstly, is that the soil type, according to the geological survey, is actually indeterminate, which isn't very easy to farm. But if you were to sort of classify it, you'd call it a sandy clay loam, which can be quite difficult at times. And obviously this winter has not been easy. Um, but we're doing OK, I think. So the market garden is basically four hectares of open field cropping in half hectare plots. Um, and um, between those in the last few years, we've established an agri uh, forestry. Um, which is fruit trees of apples, pears and stone fruits. Um, so that's sort of how we've divided it down in the last few years. Originally, there were just tracks between so we could take access to manage the crops and harvest, etc. So that's been our latest sort of development, which we've been working on. So we now have 120 fruit trees dividing up the site. Um, and um, we take cash crops off one year in four and then the rest of the time we're actually in a herbal lay facility building phase so we plough in year one to so plough down the herbal lay establish the vegetable crops um, and obviously crop through that spring summer autumn and into the winter coming through into the next year um, and then we establish uh, a herbal lay uh, which is then grazed for the next three years very lightly by a uh, neighbour's sheep so that's our basic system. And then all the produce uh, in the uh, site is sold for our on-site farm shop and to a few local restaurants. Um, we do have some polytunnels as well. So we have 11 polytunnels, give us about half a hectare of protected cropping as well. Um, and they're managed in a similar sort of fashion, um, but um, they're obviously quite pressured and useful um, to extend the season. Um, but we try and have um, fertility based and fertility based rest phases for them uh, on a rotation through the summer and some of the winter months as well. Um, and then all the crops are growing on a bed system and we use uh, 1.5 metre um, wheelings and the beds are formed using a bed former. And so that's our basic system across the site. Most of the open field beds are 100 metres long. Um, and it's about 40 beds in total. So that gives you a fairly good overview um, of basically what we're doing uh, as, as you know, for the business for the farm shop. And then coming to the, the living mulches part of it, um, as I just said, we start off by ploughing uh, and then we took the decision we were going to intercrop, uh, sorry, mulch the whole site last year after my um, meeting with Matt and um, Mark and um, we established using Aberace which is the smaller white clover um, and um, we drilled in four lines which basically ran either side of the veg we were going to sow or plant so all plant material on the farm we grow from seed in plugs and then plant out or we do some direct sowing depending what the crop's going to be. So in some of the images you can see obviously um, the one in the centre at the bottom that's actually a very late 
um, established crop of carrots which will be harvested through the winter and so you can quite clearly see the lines of the carrots uh, and the clover so that picture in the center at the bottom um, and then to right you've got some celeriac there and then obviously some of the images other images are showing you us setting out um, uh, so the earliest sowings were made in about may and I say it's determined by what crop we're putting in and the latest ones, which are those carrots we did in August. And our basic seed rate for the whole site was 100 grams a square metre. Obviously, and the business that we're doing compared to um, the arable side, it's much more focused on small areas. And so we can be quite top targeted in what we're doing. But it's, as you can see, there's quite a big layout and quite intensive um, how it all comes together. Um, in the machinery side, um, we're, we're, we're not very high tech. I don't spend a lot of money on machinery. I tend to buy second hand um, and refurbish uh, and modify it. So we used a Stanahay um, precision drill, which obviously on the left there, we refurbished that and altered it for our purpose so we can get our spacings correct. Um, and that did most of our drilling. Sometimes we resort to a single row push drill um, and I've got another multi row which does 15 drills, which I can use all or some of. Um, and we're looking at the potential of a slight tweak and maybe do some air seeding as well. But the basic system seemed to work very well and, and machinery wise, it was kept quite simple and obviously very low cost. Um, and we chose the Aberace because of the fact that it's it's in the previous trials that we've done, the larger varieties were very competitive with the veg and problematic. Uh, whereas the Aberace, uh, from some of the images, you probably go to the next slide, Matt, you can see it's not very tall. Um, so on the left there with some, um, they're actually cauliflower, they're, they're um, that's Brussels sprouts early on there and you can see they're, they're quite short and that would have been that would have been somewhere in about August by the looks of that and it doesn't get very tall and in the picture below that that's in the stubble from the sweet corn and it's still a very low mat and that obviously been in the ground since May and we've been harvesting August and September taking the corns off so that's probably an image probably October November there so it was it, it, it was certainly the right variety for us and it worked very well um we have done some work with um, other white clovers and yellow trefoil, but they were quite difficult to manage. Um, and so I'm quite pleased with the Aberace. It's worked very well in what we want to do. Um, and then in, in the in weed control and termination, um, we've got the, the question of um, firstly, establishment wise, because we use um, irrigation using drip tape irrigation. Um, there wasn't a problem establishing because there's always plenty of moisture and you can probably see some black lines in some of those images and that's the drip tape we were using so we always had no problem whatever the weather whether it was may june july or august to establish because there's always plenty of moisture along the side of the um, tea tape which creates a wet, like a wet seam in the soil and um, which obviously permeates out and there's no trouble with um, then germinating your clover um, we, you can probably see some white sheeting in those images on the top left and the middle on the bottom. All our brassica crops are actually covered with fleece to stop insect damage and obviously keep the butterflies from laying eggs. Um, so that goes down almost immediately after planting out our plugs. Um, and, and obviously the clover is under there as well. Um, and one development we're going to probably make is try and do a secondary drilling once you've got all the um, planting done and get some clover down the wheelings as well so you can get more coverage of the site. Um, and we'll come back to the benefits of that in a, in a later piece that I've um, noted. Um, only a small amount of hand weeding is required because um, planting is into uh, the beds which are flushed for weeds and then flame weed before we sow a plant. Um, there's no need for termination because we're moving on to a herbal lay. And so basically at the end of the time, and these images you're seeing now in the centre particularly, uh, is this um, late winter. We will just lightly, as soon as the ground's dry enough, we'll lightly cultivate it. Uh, and then we we'll, shall broadcast on the herbal lay seed and then just roll it. And then that's going to stay like that for the next three years um, when it will be 
just manage with grazing before it comes back around in the rotation for another cash crop. Um, the only other problem we have seen at times, pigeons can be a bit of a problem. They do quite like clover, so you just have to be a bit careful with, with pigeons, we found. Um, but generally, um, obviously, earlier on, we've got the fleece down, and then later on, um, we may have to, if we've had some um, kites up on poles, that's worked quite well. And we do use a gas, gas banger at times, particularly when we've got things like purple sprouting about, which they love, obviously, um, and they will go into our cattle crops as well. So that's the end of a problem we've noticed. Um, in terms of challenges, um, the shallow rooted crops struggled and they didn't didn't work basically because of the competition in the root zone. Um, um, and so we won't be. Can you hear me still? Um, so yeah, we work um, because of the competition in the root zone. Whereas the brassicas, the squashes, the sweet corn, the carrots, the parsnips have all done very successfully. I haven't got any any data, but you know, from year on year cropping, we've no seen no um, effect to our yield at all. But certainly in in the um, in the celeriac leeks and celery, they definitely didn't like the competition. So that's one we're gonna have to look at and, and try and try something a bit different. Um, the other thing we've really noticed this year, and it was touched on earlier in the earlier presentation, is that the uh, the soil is so much better with the clover covering it. In the past, we'd have had bare weed free soil, um, which is is great because there's no weeds. But actually, the clover being there means it's really much more stable and, and easy to get about. And you've got to bear in mind we're walking up and down these beds because most of these are winter brassicas, all winter long harvesting, and so they can get quite messy. And there's no indication in these images at all of that problem this winter. So that's been a real bonus as far as we're concerned. Um, and then I've got a few pointers about um, our plan for this year, really. Um, which we're thinking, and obviously, as I just mentioned, we're going to not put any clover with the, uh, the shallow root, just the salaria, the leeks and the celery. Um, but look at um, maybe some intercropping with some parsnips or some carrots or something because they'll be non-competitive and obviously they're deep rooting and they don't interfere in that root zone. Um, also thinking about um, the point I mentioned earlier about putting um, some seed down the weedings once you've got our fleece covers down. I think that would be quite useful and then trying an air seeder as well. So I think for us the things that I want to sort of you to take home with you really of what we've found is that to the low growing in a market garden situation is like magic and i have tried some taller varieties i mentioned and they definitely are a problem as is trefoil it just gets all tangled up and everything can be quite difficult to work with um timing uh, and spacing is is important to match it with the crop you're putting in so some of the crops we put in uh, we actually led in with the clover um and when it came up then I've got a guarded uh, flame weeder that I can flame weed down between the clover and then go back in with particularly carrots and sow them in. Um, and that worked very well. Um, and one other thing I was thinking about um, is looking at the other alternatives and a few points would have been made. So I'll be investigating those a bit more. But uh, yeah, mulches and intercrop in, in a market garden could work quite well, I think. I think that's all I've got to share with you, really. Any questions? Yeah, that's brilliant. Very inspiring. I just had a quick question, David. Um, you're doing it in the fields. I wondered, are you doing it in the polytunnels as well with any of the sort of the longer term growing crops, things like tomatoes, aubergines and the like? Uh, so the crops we tried in tunnels, we did some uh, carrots for Christmas. So they went in in August. Uh, and we established the clover first and then went and burnt out the weeds and then went back in with the carrot seed and that's worked very well. Um, I haven't tried anything with aubergines and tomatoes yet and it's something I want to look at. Um, we grow a lot of um, sweet potatoes in one tunnel and I want to try and play about with some ideas in there. A sweet potatoes is quite a challenging crop because it has a lot of top growth. I've never grown sweet potatoes but the top growth is phenomenal and it will create mat. 
um, but that ideally is not the best thing for the soil. And so when it came out this last winter, and it was a tricky winter, the soil is not in the best shape. So although we've had a good crop out, and 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 the, the biggest trouble with sweet potatoes is you have to, they they grow straight down, not like a conventional potato. So you can gather a potato going in the soil could be up to six inches long. So when you're getting them out, you have to dig a trench to get them out. So you've got a lot of soil disturbance, um, which in a damp year like we had a lot autumn and winter is it can be a bit messy. So that hasn't been ideal. Um, but if we could get some lines in there of something that, you know, and it wouldn't compete with them because they just smother it. That might be better for the soil structure, because uh, which is like as I mentioned earlier, that's one of the biggest benefits we've seen this winter is the different condition the soil's in, even though it's been so wet, it's so much better to walk on. And that's that's magic. And even now the clover, although it's tillering out, it's staying very low. Um, and obviously the plan is, and part of our whole, whole thought was if we've got some white clover established in the cash crop, we can should be able to carry that over then into the herbal layer. So it's already in the soil doing its best. Well, we've got a cash crop off and then it'll roll over into our herbal layers as well. Right, thank you. There, there's a question coming from Lincoln just asking for um, to describe the flaming um, of the clover before carrots in a bit more detail, just how how you do that? Uh, so uh, I've got a handheld um, flame weeder uh, and you, I've made, I've actually custom made a guard for it. So you can have them without a guard on, uh, you can buy a guard for them, which I guess the standard guards about 450 mil wide. So it's got a, a top canopy and two sides, so you can go down a bed and not affect things either side but with the carrots I've got a much closer space in so I've made one up which is probably only about half that if that and it's the same things so it's got cleats with your fame targeted at the soil and as long as you run it close to the ground it won't affect the side crops so that was it's quite straightforward um I have got a tractor mounted one as well but that's it's a bit too much to go in the tunnels and you have to be careful around polythene so you have to manage them very carefully <laughs> Well, there's lots of questions coming in the chat now, aren't there? Okay. Um, I wonder. Oh, yeah. So Lincoln's just following on there with the. Does the single flaming uh, terminate the clover? No, no, because I'm guarding the clover. So I'm clo I'm actually burning off between the two um, lines of clover before. So what I'm trying to do, mm. I've established the clover. So then obviously I've, I've had to irrigate, overhead irrigate to get the clover to germinate because obviously tunnels. Uh, have no natural water so you have to get your clovers to germinate and then once you've got that germinate and you've got a flush of weeds then you can then burn down the line and take out all the seedlings you might have to burn twice it depends what your weeds are hmm. okay and it's great so yeah i mean we sort of wanted the rest of the session really to be a general discussion and it's a this all kinds of interesting questions in the chat there um so I, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to kind of cover all of them. And I recognize that some people on the call are very much like horticulturalist gardeners and there's some arable people. So we better make sure we kind of cover both sides. But um, I can see some of these are about horticulture. So we've got Tolly here, Ian Tollers, who's a well-known um, organic gardener. And there's a couple directly for you, Tolly. I don't know if you can see them there. Someone asking you about your undersown tomatoes and peppers and I think whether you're irrigating the clover you know to keep that going alongside your um, tomatoes and peppers do you want to answer that yes um yeah we under so when the crop is starting to flower so they're about half a meter tall um we do irrigate um we irrigate up to about the end of July with overhead irrigation tunnels and then we stop we don't actually water tomatoes from middle of August onwards at all we keep them completely dry so the clover does tend to suffer a bit towards the end of the summer it gets very hot in tunnels it mm. manages to live and we leave it in place right up until the following sort of end of January early February and then with with direct, usually direct drilling either spinach or carrots into that resultant lay oh really and uh, and it doesn't compete too much no with the, with we the... um we hoe it off very slightly so we do actually get rid of it by by very gentle hoeing so we're not plowing obviously in tunnels but we're hoeing yeah. so we, yeah. we do have to get rid of it it's not a permanent mulch it's relatively short term so it's in place for around it's in place for around seven seven months in, in total yeah that sounds that's great yeah um oh let me go to a arable one i pippa my friend pippa the soil scientist is on this um how do you Cope. Does it has anyone had problems with cereal volunteers in the living mulch uh, before trying to direct drill the next crop? 
Syrian volunteers in the living mulch. Okay, yeah. So has anyone had that problem? Because I guess just sort of a weed, the cereal's becoming a weed in the living mulch. Yeah, I'm actually a bit concerned about that in my winter oats because they're grown for, well, some of them are grown for Gleed Farm, who are gluten free. And I didn't really ah. think about it before I put them in and actually having, if if the if I get um, barley coming in them, that's not going to be ideal. So yeah. I'm going to have to monitor that fairly closely. Yeah. Oh, actually, I suppose Mark Lee, yeah, you, Mark, I don't know if he's still on the call, but that was a big problem, wasn't it, in Mark's system last year, wasn't it, that there was the, I can't remember if it was the oats in the rye or the rye in the oats. It, Yeah, hi, can you hear me, Julia? <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. I yeah. am here, yeah. Yeah, we did, because yeah. we'd under, in, in the third year of our trial, which was harvested last year, we undersowed spring wheat with winter oats and had because we'd had the drought in 22, we'd thrown a lot of small wheat over the back of the combine, which grew in the following crop. So we had a lot of volunteer spring wheat. Sorry, Matt, we had a lot of volunteer spring wheat in uh, in our winter oats. Yeah, so um, yeah. that was that was a big challenge. We're trying to think very carefully now about sequences of cropping to try and avoid that problem. Um, yeah. Things that we can clean out. So we, we, we've switched maybe more to oats preceding rye or oats preceding something else that we can we know we can separate. But, uh, mm. yeah one of the many problems trying not to be too negative but <laughs> no no you're <laughs> persevering oh yeah and that's right Pip I'd forgotten I don't know if you're going to show your face but there's a, a Leeds University has a really interesting trial that mm. includes a living mulch kind of treatment within it doesn't it Pippa yeah so it's really interesting to hear you guys Matthew as well about what yeah, we've got a trial and we've um, had a living mulch, uh, it, you know, we included more than just clover. We had, you know, multi-species living mulch and then we're planning to put, spring, well, we have sown spring barley last week into it, but we had this issue with all the wheat winter wheat volunteers and, you know, how to get rid of them and what to do. Yeah. And we grazed sheep as tough as we could and then they still pop up like within about 10 days of the sheep coming off and, so it's really interesting to hear what everyone else is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. And I can see there, um, yeah, some really interesting comments. I want to go back to one actually from way back uh, earlier in the meeting. Uh, I think it was Alain. Alain Peters from Belgium. I think you're from Belgium and France. Are you still there? Because you say you've successfully developed a system. So I really wanted to hear more about that. Um, I don't know if you're still, if he's still on the call, Alain. Are you still there? He says, I've success, successfully developed a system with dwarf white clover in Belgium and France. Uh, Lincoln, oh, Lincoln's got a question too. But yeah, maybe Alain's not with us, not here anymore. Um, yeah, did you want to jump in, Lincoln? Yeah, I would love to say something if that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. I appreciate all this. I'm um, from Massachusetts, which is in the northeastern mm -hmm. U.S. Um, and first, I'll just say uh, we're we're running trials with I'm organizing um, living mulch trials at 15 farms here. And so anyone who's on this, I'll throw my email in the chat. But anyone who's on this call who wants to talk in depth, we're doing small grains, row crops and vegetables trials on conventional farms and organic farms. And so I would oh, love fantastic. to connect. I was very excited to find out about this project. Um, I have a million questions and also I can just bring to bear a lot of different experiences here. Um, it started because we've had a lot of luck with growing vegetables directly in uh, Dutch white clover living mulch for about the last five years. Um, some crops seem to do better than others. It's really all about how they play together. I was interested to hear about those wheat variety trials. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly have seen very unexpected results where one variety does great and another one really fails, but mostly we're trying what I call the zipper method, which is really creating a very narrow slot and putting a transplant or direct seeding certain crops into that slot and then the timing of the mowing after that is very important. So there's only a single mowing event usually that happens, but it needs to happen uh, right after the clover has bounced back and at that phase when your cash crop is not vigorous yet. And it seems like when we get that timing right, um, we can get really nice crops uh, in particular of, of tomatoes, um, beans, bush beans and green beans, um, a lot of brassicas, um, 
cabbage and and kale and collards. Um, what else has worked? Swiss chard, um, winter squash. Hemp does really well for us. That's a crop around here a little bit. Um, and I'm in contact with folks who've had varying levels of success with um, with small grains and row crops also. So, so, so you're mowing. So you're mowing between the rows of these of the vegetables then. Yeah. And which, at which, our, yeah, yeah. At our scale, you know, I can do that with a, a lawnmower. Yeah. I, uh, there's a couple folks, maybe Stuart's on this call, who he built like a four row. Um, it's like a four row hydraulic, you know, set of lawnmowers. It's actually mowing between his rows of sunflowers, oilseed sunflowers. And there's a fellow that I communicate with a lot in Ontario, in Canada, who has a very similar style thing. And he's going between corn and, or maize and uh, soybeans. And he's planting his wheat in two twin rows on 30 inch centers. I'm sorry, this is, I think, in inches. Um, <laughs> I don't even know how to convert that. So there's two twin <laughs> rows that are about five inches apart and 30 and, but they're on 30 inch center. So it fits the same pattern as his maize and soy. Um, so yeah, it seems like often um, that mowing is important for us in small grains, overwintered small grains. I, I don't have a great way to quantify them, but um, it seems, you know, Matthew, I think of a very similar experience where if if it's going to establish um, later than, the, you know, once the clover is past its vigorous growing and it's going to start really quickly in spring before the clovers jumped out, um, you know, rye, winter wheat, triticale seem to all be doing quite well uh, in the system. But we are seeing some yield loss and the figuring out the profitability has a lot to do with it's whether somebody cuts that or grazes it and how many field passes we can reduce. Great. Interesting. Yeah, has anyone uh, got any other questions or comments to share? Oh, thanks. There's your email, yeah. Rupert, I, do you mind me asking you, I can see you in the corner of my screen there, and I showed that picture of your field where you tried some different establishment methods um, of the, uh, for the grain, for the uh, cereal in the living mulch. And I can't remember what you were trying. Can you remind us the different methods you've tried out and maybe how it's going? Oh, can't hear you still, actually. I wonder why that is. Okay. That's it. Got you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for laying this on. So we've done sort of three trials. I have to say they're not replicated across the field, um, but it's it's uh, two years of uh, white clover, small leaf white clover. Um, I found um, uh, uh, Matthew, I'm really interested in what you said because you had some medium white clover, I think. I might be wrong on that. And that didn't work for me because it was too competitive. But in this instance, we um, we we had sheep on it for two years. We then f couldn't get it grazed down quite tight enough in October. Uh, so we flailed it uh, to within about sort of three quarters of an inch, um, literally. Um, and then we've done three things. So we've um, we've either disked it twice to knock the clover back, disked it very, very lightly, sort of one and a half inches, something like that, one and a half, two inches. Um, interesting that, uh, again, Matt, I don't know whether it was you who was saying it, I think it was you saying it, um, is that, you know, I just wonder whether we're creating a really good space for weeds to Come, come, come in. And although I'm really confident that we will have um, a blanket of clover understory when we take the crop off, rather like your spring barley showed there, um, I just wonder whether we are creating a really good space for uh, weeds to come away. Um, and then we direct, then we drilled it with a, a Claydon drill. Um, uh, anyway, the the wheat is looking great. That went in on the 14th of October. So very, I think. Uh, um, 
was that a month before your timings? I forget whether it was a month before your timings. I'm actually going to be much bolder this year, and I'm going to drill uh, in around the 20th of September. Um, that might be a bit early. It could be the 24th of September, uh, and then I'm going to graze it with sheep. I've got to be quite careful with grazing with sheep because we're a, we're, we're a sort of medium sandy clay loam, and when it gets wet and sticky, I think we could do quite a bit of damage. But I think we could be bolder, um, and uh, you know, in our case, we we can compartmentalise and we could put quite a lot of sheep on on quite a small area and move them off quite quickly. Um, the other bit we've done is direct is having flailed it as before. We've gone in direct with a Claydon drill, and that's the one I'm most uh, excited about, really, in that I think um, we've done enough cultivation to take out the compaction from sheep. And sheep do cause compaction. Um, uh, and then finally, we've gone in with a direct drill, uh, a disc drill. That's the one that I think is going to do the least well. Um, uh, uh, but the one I'm most excited about, uh, if that's the right word to use, um, is is going in with that Claydon drill without uh, disking it. Because what, you know, with disking, you know, we're making ourselves vulnerable to the weather at that time of year. Uh, and also we are um, uh, using fuel, you know, and, and metal, neither of which I want to, neither of which I want to do, um, uh, really. So that anyway, that's what we've done for this. Uh, that's what we've done this last autumn. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Rupert. And I'm planning on stopping in over the summer a few times just to see how it's doing, because I think it's it's really interesting, useful to get that kind of practical info on some of those challenges. I noticed that actually, I learned the guy was trying to uh, um, get a response from, but I think he's left. He had asked, I think, a question there about the best way to knock back the, uh, what was recommended is the best way to knock back the uh, clover. So that's kind of what we're we're looking at at Rupert's place. Yeah, so um, we've actually gone over time a little bit. So I don't know if anyone has any other burning questions or if we should start to wrap things up here. Does anyone else have any sort of final questions or comments they wanted to make? Great, I mean, it's really great. I mean, I um, I guess we're gonna have people's contact details, right, uh, Matt and Izzy, we're always, but I think Izzy's gonna drop in the chat now also uh, a link to a feedback survey. I think we can just give us some, your feedback on this event and also, a link to uh, join our join our mailing list, right, Izzy? That's yeah. That's I've just fun. popped it in the chat now. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. Yeah. So it, that's the actual living mulches list, isn't it? So I think on that you can mm -hmm. sort of chat select that you're interested in living mulches. You can also, of course, um, just get our general communications from Organic Research Center as well. So. Yeah, thanks everyone. I have to, I, I think I had a slide, but I'm not going to show it now, but I think my slide said something about thanking people like Dominic and Izzy and also um, uh, Dominic and Izzy. Dominic, yes, who was before <laughs> Izzy and Matt as well. Uh, and also Elizabeth Gilmore Charitable Foundation, who has funded the work most recently and all the different farmers who've been uh, involved in these projects over the years. And so, yeah, please, um, Give us some feedback and join up with our mailing list and we'll keep everyone up to date on what we're doing around living mulches um, with ORC and hopefully we can all keep learning from each other. That's about it. I don't know if anyone else wants any final comments or we can all say adieu. <laughs> can I ask one question, please? Um, yeah. How long do you think we'll be able to carry on with a living mulch before having to remove it? Uh, oh, and that's right. what I, which I don't want to do because uh, I really don't want to plough. I really don't want to plough yeah, if I can yeah. help it. Well, I mean, uh, I wasn't quite clear on your system, Matt, whether you were ploughing in that rotation or whether I, I, I think you did say, but I must have missed it, or whether you sort of do intend you are going to be going in and out of tillage in that I'm, system. I'm just going to see how the perennial weeds look in it. I'm, I'm not, I've not yeah. really tried to fit it into my system yet. It's sort of just one field and see how it goes. So yeah, yeah. Um, but actually, it, it, it's looking so competitive at the minute that there's not going to be a lot of perennial weeds in there, bar the, what was already established. Um, yeah. The problem with clover is that it kind of dies back to nothing over winter, which leaves a lot of space for stuff to come in early spring. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really going to know until next April and then it'll be too late, I think. So. Yeah, 
I, I, I don't know if we know the answer to that exactly, Rupert, but I do I do understand from various people who and some people who've been on the chat, including John Posey, who's left now, that I think the and Mark Lee might have a comment too that the weeds can sort of eventually get the better of you. And I, yeah, how long that is before that happens, don't know. Lincoln, did you have a thought on that? <laughs> Yeah, we've seen quite a bit of variability, but I would say three to five years. And the main thing that comes in there is pasture grasses, you know, perennial grasses, native. Mm -hmm. um, we're not seeing any huge annual weed problems at all, but it does eventually start to look like a pasture with a lot of clover in it. Um, <laughs> and that happens um, over, yeah, three to five years on my farm where we've been doing it longest i think my soil has gotten somewhat tired of clover and the stand wears out more quickly now mm. um and so on a poor field it seems to persist longer uh or a field that hasn't grown much clover but i in an organic system i don't see a way around tillage uh every some number of years uh to control those perennial grasses i'm actually considering using herbicide for the first time at my farm so that I don't have to um, plow up my one of my fields this year that really needs the clover stand renewed. Um, yeah. So I'm 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 balancing yeah. those. Uh, you yeah, know. yeah, that's a tough. It's a, a difficult decision, but the trade offs between yeah, the damage from plowing versus the impact of the herbicide is a yeah. Yeah. Now we're talking about pasture cropping in the chat. I know we were trying to wrap this up, but pasture cropping meaning what are we meaning by that? Matt, you suggested a video of Nick Padwick. Is that, Padwick, is that? Yeah, so, so the pasture cropping is a form of the living mulch, but it's just sown in rows and the, and the sort of gap is left for the cereal crop to be interplanted. And you need you need a strip strip mower or strip tiller to be able to do it. So you need a pretty pricey piece of kit. But Nick has these sort of I think there's he's got maybe three or four varieties in the lay um, he's got um, a burnet a plantain a clover and something else um, mm. and and then he's yeah he's, he's drilling into that they stay in for about three four years he's in the second or third year of his system he the video I've dropped in there was produced with agroecology this year um, it's he explains it a lot more eloquently so I'd definitely take a look at it um, okay. it's sort of you're kind of going half into cropping half full living mulch uh, okay okay I think Andrew Wolf you've, you've you've popped your hand up I know you mentioned pasture cropping earlier in the chat yes I've tried it and it, I'm sure it's going to be successful when I have another go at it but it's it's roller crimping using a multi a three multi um, crimping devices designed by Ted Konecki of Auburn University and um, you followed that by a Krauss disc drill and I tried it for a couple of years and I haven't got the cash crop variety quite right but um, it, the way the beans were, were, were growing, it was very successful, but the bean variety didn't get to um, maturity fast enough. So therefore the cash crop wasn't quite right. But I'm sure if I, when I get the finances up and running again, it will be, um, I'll sort it out and um, it, it will wash this space. Thank you. Great. Yeah, we will, Andrew, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, is that a final, just a final comment, maybe, Lincoln? Oh, your hand's still up. Ah, OK. <laughs> OK. Oh, now it's up again. Now, oh, you're both, that's OK. OK, no one's <laughs> I, th I think I think we are maybe, I think we might be done. Shall we release our uh, speakers who've been very generous with their time, Matthew and David, and uh, thanks to everyone who came along and provide a really useful discussion and we'll we'll try and keep in touch with everyone. Thanks. Thank you.